Turn to the book of Judges, chapter 2. And um, Lisa and I, on the way back uh, Friday, driving on the way back, uh, we were listening to preaching all the way back home. And uh, we hadn't done that in a while. And I thought, you know, I've got some old Reg Kelly sermons from years ago and saved up on my phone, and we played them. And I think we ended up going through, uh, I think we had like a, ended up being an eight-hour trip. And if you know Reg Kelly, that got us through about three sermons. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was good to go back and hear some things that, we had learned years ago things that God helped us with years ago and God to remind us of some things. And um, I, I, won't, I won't say that everything out of this message this morning is original. Um, and I, maybe I, I think I'm going to preach a series, I believe, on the life of Samson. I'm not positive on that. I just know that, that this part, God has given it to me for today. And uh, so I want you to be praying for me. And, and in the course of this, I'm going to tell you about a young man by the name of Andrew. Uh, but anyway, in Judges chapter 2, verse 14, uh, the Bible says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered him into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Now this is in the time when Moses has died, Joshua has taken leadership, of the camp and the armies of Israel and they're going in they're now being allowed to go into the promised land and God has told them more than one occasion when you go in I want all of the enemies killed I want every one of them out so that you can live free in this land you'll not be bothered you'll not be tempted you'll not be uh, taken over by strangers and by other people that are not of you and he said if you'll do that I'll bless you I'll, I'll give you things, I'll bless your fields, I'll bless your children, I'll bless your cities. Uh, you read Deuteronomy 28, there's a whole list of things that God said He would bless if they would just do what He said. How, how true is that, amen? And I don't believe that we obey God to get salvation. I don't believe we earn salvation through our works. But I will tell you that if you will just do what God said, you will find that life is a lot easier by doing it God's way than by doing it the world's way. Somebody say amen. And so anyway, the, but sure enough, as soon as they get in there, well, Joshua ends up making deals with some of the people that are in that land. He goes against God's word. And there's a whole list there in, uh, I think it's in the, either the book of Joshua or book of Judges, of all the people that, that they left. That they just for the, All the seven nations that God said to get rid of, they left portions of them in that land. They did not do what God said. If God said, get rid of it all, what does he mean? If God tells you to pour all the liquor out of your house, He does not mean leave a bottle of whiskey out in the garage. Amen? If God tells you to dump the drugs, He does not mean have a stash hid away somewhere where you can get to it in case you need it. And I, Listen, I've been down this road. I know what it's like. If God tells you to get rid of them playboys or He tells you to get off the internet, you do it. If God tells you to shut your mouth and quit talking bad about everybody, you do it, amen. If God tells you to do something, you do it and do it completely and do it thoroughly. And if you can't, if you know you can't do that, find somebody that'll go with you and help you through life. I believe that we're here to help one another. Say amen. In fact, that's what I'm preaching on this morning. I believe God can raise us up and I'm going to say it now and you're going to, oh my goodness, Mike's got off on false blasphemy. I believe according to scripture that God can raise us up in this world and in this generation at this time to be saviors. Now I haven't read the scripture yet. So you don't know if I'm telling blasphemy or not. But I'll read the scripture. And I'll show you that's exactly what God said. Okay? So just hang with me. Don't get mad at me yet. All right? Now watch this. Whithersoever they went, verse 15, whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. And I'll tell you, you live against God's ways, that's, you're going to be walking upstream your whole life. If God loves you, I thought about this this morning. If God loves you and He means to work in your life, He'll make your life of sin hard on you. 
And it'll wear you down. And you'll get to a point where you think, man, I can't live like this anymore. If God hates you and he means to turn you over to a reprobate mind and send you to hell, he'll make life easy breezy for you. You'll be rich. That's why God told us in the book of Psalms, he said, don't envy not against the evildoers. Don't be upset when you see everybody else out there living like dogs out there going to hell and how they're making all kinds of money and they're having parties and they're happy all the time. It seems like everything's going well for them. Don't, don't want to be like them. God said, because I'm going to get them in the end of their life. I'm going to let them just, I'm just going to let them think that everything's fine and they can get away with everything. Jeffrey Epstein probably thought he could get away with every girl that he raped under the age of 18 which was probably in the hundreds, if not thousands of them. He thought he could get away with all of that by his friends and his contacts and the money that he had and the number of people that he kept tabs on who were flying out to that island to do all that filthy stuff out there, including Bill Clinton, including a bunch of other names that all of a sudden they don't want it. They said, Jeffrey who? But he ended up hanging either by his own hand or by somebody else in prison. Now, the Bible says that it is a curse for a man to hang from a tree. So he died a curse, and Jeffrey Epstein, I guarantee you that man is in hell right now, lifting up his eyes, being torments in the flames. He didn't get by with nothing, and nobody will. So anyway, if God loves you, he'll make it hard on you. Verse 16, nevertheless, the Lord raised up what? Judges. Now, I'm going to read this passage from another place in the Bible. It's going to say something different. Maybe you can guess what it's going to say. The Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Let me ask you a question. Do you know somebody that needs help that you think you can help them? Do you know somebody that needs deliverance out of a situation or a part of their life where you believe that you can help them in some way, some shape, or some form, raise your hand or say amen. Let it be known that you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you being God, being the Savior of all mankind. But he said, judges with a little J. When he referred to Christ, they capitalized it. The judge, capital J. Think, think this four times in the Bible. The Creator, capital C. That way you know it's God. But here it's Judges, little j. Which deliver them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Have you ever saved somebody's life? Have you ever prevented somebody from getting into some kind of terrible situation or harm? If you have, God used you to deliver them and help them out of the hand of those that hated them. Uh... There was a, we were at a, a family member's uh, pool one time, several years ago, and all the kids was in the pool swimming, and I was standing there, had a brand new pair of bib overalls on, had, had just tickled to death to have them, and uh, had my shoes on, had my cell phone, I put my cell phone right in that little pocket there uh, that your bib overalls have on. And, uh, yes, I wear bib overalls to pool parties. And uh, all of a sudden we looked, and there was a boy that had got down in the deep end of that pool, and he was going down. I didn't think for a second. Me and another guy jumped right in there on top of him. I didn't say, no, wait a minute, i got to take my shoes off. Here, honey, hold my cell phone. Honey, hold my cell phone for me. Somebody's drowning. Hey, just hold on to it for me. I didn't do that. Wham, right in the water. Get him out of there. We got him out, made sure he was all right. And then I went, oh, man, I left my cell phone in my pocket. Oh, I got my shoes on. Oh, no, my wallet's wet. Oh, no. Well, the phone dried out, the wallet dried out, the bibs dried out, and he dried out. Everything's fine. But God had me, there's no doubt, God had me look at that exact moment. At that time, that boy was going down for the last time to save his life. I'll tell you, there's not a feeling in the world like it. So anyway, verse 17, Yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge. 
I want to ask you this morning, how many of you like for God to go with you every day of this week? Say amen. You'd like the Lord to be with you. You'd like to never be without Him and know that He's always going to be there with you to help you and maybe to help you help somebody else because that's how it's done. I can do nothing in and of myself. I cannot change enough things about myself to be an inspiration to others. Only God can do that in me. Only God can aid me. I'm standing up here this morning trying not to save your life. I'm trying to save your soul. I'm more interested about your soul than I am your life. Now, I'll pray for your health, and I'll pray that you won't get sick, or I'll pray that you're good, when you're going to have surgery that you'll, you'll be over it soon and be out of pain and all of those things. But everybody's going to end up in a casket, and more than likely, I'm going to end up preaching your funeral. And I want to be able to tell the world and everybody that I know for a fact that you're in heaven because I knew you and I knew how you lived your life and I knew the Lord was with you. Or maybe God allowed me in some way through the preaching of the word to uh, make it, have an effect in your life or save something out in your life or, or benefit you in some way or to keep you from going deep into sin or to help pull you out of, of deep sin that you're in. I would like to be known... And know it in my heart that God has used me somehow, some way in this world. That's what I'm saying. So when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Listen, if we can have compassion upon people that are down and out and suffering and hurting, and sometimes then it doesn't matter that they did it to themselves. Well, if they hadn't drank so much, they wouldn't end up that way. Well, if they hadn't taken so many drugs, maybe they'd still have a brain cell left to get up and go to work. You know, that's how we are sometimes. We look at lost people and say, oh, well, just look at that nasty mess over there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go over here to Walmart this afternoon. Because they were there Friday when we went by. And I did. I went, oh, look at that nasty mess over there. Bad. Bad. Awful. Yeah, of course they got themselves in that way. So did you. Didn't God use somebody in your life to lead you out of that mess you were in? Isn't God leading right now in your life, working in your life, through someone that you know to help you out of the circumstances and the situations and the lots that have been thrown into your lap? If we can have compassion on people and we're evil, don't get mad at God for saving somebody you hate. See, now I'm preaching. Because nobody says amen. Except John. John will say amen if I just say, woof, 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 woof. John will say, amen. Let's go to prayer. Father, bless the message. Bless this sermon. Lord, I, I need your help preaching it. Help me to preach it your way, not my way, not somebody else's way. Just help me today. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for the situation that, that led me into this. And Lord, I had it on my mind before. And Lord, just as I've watched everything unfold Friday afternoon, Lord, I, just, I saw it. And I thank you for that. Only you can do that. So Lord, just bless, bless it for these people. And bless it for those that are hearing uh, live online, those that will watch it uh, whenever. Somebody, Lord, t five years from now may end up watching this message. Because the, the title, and they think, what in the world is he preaching? Lord, just let it be a blessing to somebody in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Now, notice that he said there in verse 16, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. Okay? And I knew, I went, that's the first place I went looking, because I knew it said something different. And I thought it was in Judges, but it wasn't. I had to search for it. So I found it in Nehemiah. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Turn there in your Bible. Or I'll turn the, the screen off. And you won't be able to see it. Now, why do I do that? Why do I tell you to open your Bibles up? I'm trying to help you. I am. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I preach on Samson, there's a part of it that I've already got in mind unless God changes it. Where Samson gave a riddle out. And uh, he didn't figure anybody would come up with the meaning of the riddle. But then they conspired against him and they went to his girlfriend at the time 
and got the answer out of her. And when Samson asked him, did you come up with the answer? And they told him about it. And Samson said, well, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have known that. I just think that it is funny, isn't it? Oh, Samson, I, I, how would you like ladies for your husband, your boyfriend to call you the old heifer? If you hadn't plowed my heifer, you wouldn't have known that. And, what, and I had to think, you know, I was driving. I was thinking, Lord, what do you mean by that? What, is, what does that mean? And uh, what it means is that they were relying on what somebody else said. And the meaning behind that is, if all you do is rely upon what I tell you, that ain't right. If you rely, I call it the Bethel Welfare Program. If the only Bible you get through the week is what I read to you on Sunday morning, you're in sorry shape. You are. Read it for yourself. As I know some of you do. Read it and study it for yourself. That way, when, when, I, when I say, now, I might be preaching heresy here. If you know the Bible, you know I'm not. You'll say, go ahead, preacher, preach it. I already know where you're going. Because you know the Bible. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 24. So the children went in and possessed the land. And this, is, this is after now. They've been through 70 years of Babylonian captivity. They've lived in the land. They suffered all the things that they suffered because they wouldn't turn their hearts back to God and keep it that way. And so God delivered the, the northern tribes into the hand of the Syrians, Assyrians and He delivered uh, Judah and Benjamin into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, for 70 years. Now they've come back into the land. Nehemiah said, is, is retelling the story of the Exodus. And he said, so the children went in and possessed the land and thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities and fat land and possessed houses full of all goods and wells digged and vineyards and olive yards and fruit trees in abundance. In other words, when they got to the land, they didn't have to worry about building a house and, and plowing up the ground so they could plant corn and plant vineyards. They were already there. They just took... What was there? I mean, they spoiled that land. God delivered it into their hands, just like He gave to Adam when He first put Adam in the Garden of Eden. God, Adam didn't have to plant a thing. He, God made him the gardener over the Garden of Eden, but He didn't have to do anything. He just stand around, walk around. Oh, that tree looks good. That tree looks good. That boy, that grapevine looks good over there. Boy, I'm going to eat good today. And He did that every day that He was in the garden before He sinned. I don't know how long it was, but anyway... So they had it all good. They were filled, became fat, and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. And that's what we like to do. We like to say, oh, the Lord's been good to me. Oh, God's been good to me. He's blessed me and He's given me this. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. You know what that is? That's churches firing pastors for preaching the Bible. That's the 21st century equivalency of them slaying the prophets. They just fire the preacher or ruin him so bad and make it so hard on him that he leaves in tears and you get you some guy in or some young guy in or whatever that doesn't know the Bible, doesn't believe half the Bible and you know that you're going to pay him well enough to where his heart will be turned toward you and not toward God. Um... But anyway, verse 27, Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. That's almost identical to what he said back in uh, Judges. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them what? There it is. Judges, in uh, the book of Judges, saviors, in the book of Nehemiah. God sent them saviors, people, that God was with them. Mighty men, that God was for them, and God was helping them, and God uh, aided them to do impossible things. How would you like to lead a band of 300 men that bluffed, who was it, the Amorites? Bluffed the Amorites into thinking that this huge, massive army was coming against them, and all there was was 300 guys holding swords in one hand, pitchers in the other, and lights. 
And everybody said, oh my goodness, that's the armies of Israel. They're going to kill us all. And they all ran and left. And nobody had to lift up the sword to fight to do anything. They just went in and took all their stuff and went back into the camp and said, boy, aren't we happy. That's all they did. God did mighty things through the hands of those saviors. And I'm asking this morning, would you like for God to use you to be a savior in somebody's life? Not the savior, not take the place of Christ, but to be an aid and a help to them, to help them in their way of life because everybody in this world needs help. Everybody does. According to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Now, turn to, uh, let's see here. Is that, yeah. Turn to Jude chapter 1. I'm gonna, this is the second witness now that what I'm saying is not blasphemy. It's not heresy. I'm not calling you Jesus, but I would like to call you Christ-like. Amen? Wouldn't you like to be known as a Christian? Would you like to be known as Christ-like? Would you like to be fashioned and formed in the image of Christ, Jesus, our Lord? Would you like for your life to be a model and a representation? Would you like to be an ambassador for Christ? That means you go and you represent His will and His way before all of the wicked people of this world. And what we want as ambassadors for Christ is we want people to understand that there is a better way of life. That God does save people. That God does forgive people's sins. That you're not too bad to be saved. That God will forgive every sin if you'll come to Christ. That's what we want the, Lord, the, the world to know. So Jude says it this way. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. And notice this. He does put the responsibility, or at least some of the responsibility, in your hands. By saying, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now, your holy faith came from the Bible. It came from the Word of God. It came from God. But has not God given us the daily task to take up, take up a cross and follow Jesus has he not called us and compelled us to go into all the world and preach? Did he not leave that for us to do with his aid? And his, he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. I've got the power. I'll give it to you. You preach the gospel. Paul said it this way. He said, I, Paul, soweth the seed, Apollos watereth. God giveth the increase. Isn't that something that out of the three deals that's done, sowing the seed and watering and maintaining the plant. God gave it to man to do two of them. And he did one of them. He did the most important part. But he left that with us to give us something to do. To give us something to praise him for. I'm telling you that when you, rec when you uh, recollect your sins. And the wickedness of your life. And the things that you got yourself into. That God saved you out of. And then... When you walk this walk and God uses you to help somebody who in a similar situation was just like you and you poured out love for them and had mercy on them and compassion instead of, well, you stinking nasty devil, you, you shouldn't have done that. Like we never done nothing wrong. And, and help them along the way. And God used us. I'm telling you, there's nothing better in the world to know that God used you. So he said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Hey! Here it is again. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have, and of some, have compassion. Now every now and then I want to add something to the word of God. And I know I shouldn't do this. But I, I might say it. And of some have compassion for crying out loud. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And if some have compassion, have compassion, making a difference. And others, what? What do you say? Save. What does that make you? A savior. Save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment. Spotted by the flesh. So when this lady named Jackie 
who was going to our church at that time, came to me, and I had met her brother at a funeral before, and I knew that he was a sodomite. And that's, by the way, they call themselves queer, and then they get mad at me for, people have getting, gotten mad at me for saying the word queer. And uh, so I'll just use the biblical term, they're a sodomite. They act in the manner of the men of Sodom. And I knew he was a sodomite when she came to me and she said, my brother is in the hospital, he's dying of AIDS. And I talked to him and asked him if he would like for me to bring my pastor over here to him, to the hospital, to talk to him about being saved. She said, he never delayed, he just said yes, please. When she told me that, I, I don't think, it's been, a, it's been a long time ago, I don't think that I went, oh my goodness, I ain't going to ever touch that queer. I don't think I did that. I think right away God said, Mike, go do it. And I knew it was the right thing to do, and I, I really didn't have any reservation about it. I thought, well, my goodness, if he's asking for me, that's different. Because you try to witness to people that don't want it, okay, you might as well just witness to your dog and baptize your dog. Because that's about all the good it's going to do. And by the way, I did not have the opportunity to baptize him, but he's in heaven anyway. That's right. But God led me to have compassion on this young man that was soon to meet God face to face and give an account for all the sins he's committed. And in that, he was no different than Michael Hoggard. No different. And so I went trying to make a difference and trying to save this young man and trying to pull his feet out of the fire. And I believe that with God's help, the work was successful. And I believe he's in heaven now. And when I get there, I'm going to show him to every one of y'all. Or maybe some of you. I don't know. Maybe, hopefully all of you. Amen. Now I'm saying all that, say this. Uh, turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy 22. <clears throat> I'm going to wait till you get there because I want you to read this. Because this... Man, this, this nailed it for me right here. This, this passage right here, just boom, there it is. And the, the young man, I keep mentioning him, Andrew. Uh, I don't know if he's watching now. I, I sent him the link uh, to our church service. I told him about three or four times I was going to preach about him. And um, he said he goes to a church there in uh, Sullivan, so... I didn't bother him today and say, hey, watch our service instead. I didn't do that. I'm not trying to proselytize anybody. Um, but anyway, if he's listening today, whether he's listening as live or he's going to listen to it later, um, you pray for him because all these scriptures God gave me after I got home. But it just confirmed in me what God was leading me to do. In Deuteronomy 22, God is laying out some very specific laws and things that he wants done with certain people and to certain people because of things that they did. And one of the deals was, it had to do with uh, fornication relations between a man and a woman. And God made it very clear if a man uh, lay with another woman uh, and she was consenting to the deal, they both were to be stoned. Uh, Especially if a man laid with a married woman or a betrothed woman or whatever. Um, but there was a certain instance where the woman did not get killed for what, for what happened. And he says it here in verse 25. If a man find a betrothed damsel. In other words, this, this is a young girl now. Believe it or not, she probably would have been anywhere between 12 and 15 years old. That was a very common practice. As soon as you became childbearing, um, more than likely you were getting married. But if a man found a betrothed damsel in the field and the man forced 
her and lie with her. Then the man only that lay with her shall die. Now, isn't God fair? And by the way, he says it. If you look at verse 26, he equates this with capital punishment, the same as like killing somebody. But unto the damsel thou shalt not do nothing, uh, or thou shalt do nothing. There is, there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. In other words, it's worthy of capital punishment, death penalty. It's the same as murdering. This girl got raped. And she's not supposed to die. But the man is. For verse 27, for he found her in the field. And look, listen, look at your Bible. And the betrothed damsel cried. And there was none to save her. And I got to thinking. But all the women in this world that have been raped and they cried and they screamed and no one was there to hear them. Some of them even being murdered afterward in the most violent, torturous manner. And though they screamed and cried, there was no one to save them. What a horrible thing. People who wake up or they get trapped somehow in a car fire or their house fire. And they can't get out because of the flame, because of the smoke. And though they cry and cry and scream in agony and pain, being on fire. No one can get to them or there's no one there to hear them. And they die in serious agony. Children then have been beaten, bruised, knocked around, cursed at, violated. And because of fear, there was no way to shout out, no way to cry. And it makes you wonder, you know, this, this is what causes some people to say, why does God allow that to happen? If God is God is love, this is why I don't believe in God. If God, if there's a God, then he's not a good God because he lets people suffer. Listen, there's nobody in this world innocent. Amen. There's nobody innocent. And even... The one that was Jesus Christ. Did God allow his suffering? Did God allow him to be tortured and bruised and cursed and mocked and spit on and whipped and then killed in a most torturous manner? Sure he did. The only innocent person who ever lived in this world suffered and died. And... No one to save him. Even if he could have called the angels, he wasn't going to. And it makes you, it, it just makes you have compassion then when you hear of somebody that years ago I had to go over. A, a pastor that I knew from Bible college called me from Arkansas. And he said, Mike, I need you to go talk to Jim and Linda Carmichael. I said, what's the matter? He said, uh, Jim's sister died in a car wreck. She was burned up in the, in the fire in the car. And I had to go over to Jim's house and have him sit down. And he had no idea what I was going to say. And I told him that. And he, he had to call Linda. And Linda came home. And uh, Linda, Linda broke down so hard. I've never seen anybody cry that much. She wailed when I said that she burned up in the fire. There was no one to save her. Though she cried out, there was none to save her. Now, just think about that now. The next time somebody helps you. Think about it. The next time somebody helps you with something. You drop something, somebody helps you pick it up. That's a small thing, but they helped. 
I don't bend over as good as I used to. So anybody pick something up for me, I just say, you're short, you're closer to the ground, pick it up for me. No, that's, that's bad. But if somebody helps you out, and it's not trying to hit on you, or not trying to get money out of you, or not trying to get something out of you, you think about that. When you needed help, there was somebody there. Now, Friday, we're coming home, and, um, you know, we're coming up 44. We'd made it all the way to Sullivan. And I'm not kidding you, just about a tenth of a mile before we get to the first Sullivan exit. Boom! Blah, 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 blah. I hear one of the tires on that trailer out there go out. Now, that happened on the way to camp last year. Happened on the way back, different tire. I put a brand new tire on the thing on the other side, or had it as a spare. Brand new tire. And now I've got to go get another one now. But anyway, blah, 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 blah. And I pulled over. Paige pulled out in front of us. I said, Paige, just get off the turn here. We're right there to turn off. Get off the exit. Go here to this gas station right here. I'm, I'm going to get out of the highway. I'm not changing a stinking tire on the driver's side on a highway. So got down the ramp. Got pulled in this gas station. And <clears throat> they, they don't give you what you need to change a tire on these trailers. I'm telling you. And I was not prepared. They give you a tool that'll raise and lower the jacks and raise and lower the, um, the, um, uh, the spare tire. But that same tool fits the lug nuts on the tires. But if they've been put on with, a, uh, with an air gun or whatever, if they're put on uh, with that, you can't get them off. And I was just about to break this tool that I had trying to get those lug nuts off of that tire. And it just wasn't happening. So I told Lisa, there's a Walmart just not too far from there. Everything was right there. It happened in a good place. In fact, it happened in the right place. So I said, go to Walmart, get me a four-way, and that way I'm, I'll know you get the right size, and that way I'll have something to have some leverage on it. And I, can, I can try to get these lug nuts loose. So she left. By the time she left, and I may not tell all this right, but by the time she left, a young man just pulled his truck up there and he got out and I saw him coming toward me. So I, I kind of knew what he was going to say. And he said, do you need some help? And I said, well, I don't know yet. I said, I'm, I can't get these lug nuts off. They're too hard. And I said, I sent my wife up to Walmart and uh, she's going to get a four way and um, we'll try to get them off. He said, well, would you like for me to try? And you know what? I told him later in a text message, I said, I can uh, hang, tape, and finish drywall and paint it. I can paint the outside, the inside of a house. I can paint doors. I can play the piano and preach, but I'm not a mechanic. I'm not. And I, and he had, he opened the back of his truck. I mean, he had tools everywhere and I'm just going, well, he must be the guy. So he got out a, a socket set, Sterling, and he got a, he got a, a big handle on it and he put that socket on that thing and he, I heard the socket snap. He broke his sockets trying to get those lug nuts off. And I went, oh, no. And uh, he said, he said, if you'll let me, he said, I'll go to my house. And he said, I've got a uh, impact uh, wrench that I'll, or a, a tool that I'll bring back. And he said, I'll get those off of there because they were put on with an impact tool. And I said, Okay, I consented to it. And I said, uh, where do you live? He said, I'll be back in 10 minutes. You're the guy. So he left. And um, right, right before he come back, another guy, an older man, came over to me. And he said, uh, do you need some help? And I said, well, I appreciate that. And by that time, the, the young guy, Andrew is his name, he came back and he was working on it. I said, well, I got a guy here. I said, I appreciate it, though. And I got talking to him. His name was, he said, his name, I said, I'm Mike. And he said, my name's Kevin. I said, well, nice to meet you, Kevin. And I said, I really appreciate it. I, I don't just say that. I mean it. I really appreciate you coming by here. And I said, uh, but I think we got it in hand. If you, you know, if you want to raid around, that's fine. And, but I think he's got it. And he put that impact uh, thing on there. And boy, here they come. He finally broke them all loose, and that was the hard part, and that was it. 
And um, so Kevin, I shook his hand again. It's Kevin, I appreciate it. I said, by the way, I, my name's Mike. I pastor a church there in Festus. We talking a little bit. And um, so he got to know us a little bit. And then I started talking to Andrew. And uh, Matthew had just called us um, as we were coming home saying that he got a promotion at work. They're going to put him up to a uh, heavy equipment operator. And it's going to be a little bit more money. And I said, oh, Matthew, hang on to that job now, okay? You hang on to that one. That's a good one, okay? And uh, so he said, yeah. And so when I uh, started talking to Andrew a little bit, I said, man, I've really pre I said, I'm a pastor here, and I just don't have the tools for it uh, with me. I said, but I'm going to get me one of those. And he said, uh, I, well, he said, well, I'm a heavy equipment operator. And I went, my son just called me. He said he got it. And I just got excited about it. He had said something I just heard from my son. I said, wow. And so I started talking to him about it. And I, and I, I he said, he mentioned that, you know, I told him how much my son was going to make. And he said, well, I make a little bit more than that. He said, I'm in the union. And I said, yeah, my son joined the union in the carpenter's union. And I, I had to sit him down and tell him, Matthew, you want to work in the union? That's fine. Everybody's got to have a job. And if they, if they're going to pay you that, I'm, I'm all for it, man, earning what he can make out of his, out of his work. I said, but you don't let him tell you how to live and you don't let him tell you how to vote. And he stood up and he said, that's exactly right. And I knew he was for Trump. <laughs> knew it right then. He said, you're in Trump territory right here. And I said, well, that's the way we are too. I said, but you know, can't say anything anymore without people getting offended at you. And he said, yeah, I know that. And we just, I mean, we just hit it off. Now he got all done. And uh, I'm not going to tell what I did. But anyway, um, he pulled his phone out and he said, for some reason, I don't know why, he just pulled his phone out. He said, uh, give me your number. And he said, my name is Andrew. He gave me his last name. I'm not going to tell you who, what it is. And he said, um, give me your number and uh, so I can get in touch with you. I said, well, okay. And I gave him my phone number. He put it in his phone and then he called my cell phone with it. And he said, that's me. And told me his last name. So Lisa put it in my phone as we was going down the road. And, uh, and just talked to him. I told him I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, and told him that I was going to mention him. Because God was already working this sermon in my mind on the way up. And him being there with us, if we were a minute late or a minute early... We passed each other. But I realized that God put that young man there with a truck full of tools and a little bit more know-how, a little bit more hand knowledge, how to use tools to get those lug nuts off that trailer and get me down the road. I needed him. Now you say, well, that's kind of a silly thing. That doesn't mean nothing. It meant something to me because I was going to have to go. We... I'm not kidding you. We got less than a mile down the road and we saw another guy pulling the trailer. He had a wrecker behind him with a guy doing the same thing. I guarantee you, he's going to pay that guy 200 bucks. I guarantee you. So this young man who did not know me from Adam came over and helped me and aided me who did not know if I, he, and I said, can I, can I pay you something? No. Can I get you something to drink? You know what? I was expecting him to say, yeah, I like Budweiser. I was going, oh no. He said, no, I drink only water. I got it there. And I, I'm going, okay. And I told him, I said, now, I pastor a church there. And I said, I'm going to preach uh, about you to the people. I'm not going to give out your full name or anything like that. But I'm going to tell your story. Because God's been working this in me all this time on the way home. And I'm telling you, it fits right in. So we got home. And Lisa said, now, send him a text now. Let him know that we got home safe. So I was okay, and I sat down and was studying this out, and I started writing him a text. And I said, Andrew, we got, just to let you know, we got home safe, and, and I said, uh, I, I, boy, I really appreciate you being there. I said, I think God had you there to help me for a reason, and I told him, I said, you know, I, I can preach and all that stuff, and I said, I'm just not a mechanic, and I said, uh, I said, if now if you ever need anything that requires the preacher's help, you just call me, and I'll be there. And I said, just, I appreciate you. And he wrote me back. And he said, I really appreciate that. He said, I'm going through a tough time right now. I'm not going to tell you what. But I wrote him back and I said, you know, he said, I go to a church here in Sullivan. 
And he said, you know, I like it. And I wrote him back and I told him, I said, now, Andrew, I said, I know that when you're around people that you know, you don't want to tell them everything there is to know about you. I said, so if you ever need to talk and just share some things with somebody that you know will keep confidence and that you know won't blab it to the whole church, call me. And he wrote me back. And he told me what the deal was. And he said, you know, he said, I know that I was there to help you. He said, but I now realize that you were there to help me. God sent somebody there to save me. God sent somebody there to help save him. No doubt in my mind about it. The fact that he wanted my cell phone number spoke to me. And Lisa said, why did he do that? I said, I don't know yet. Well, now I know. God was telling him, cry out to him. He'll hear you. I know Mike Hoggard. He'll listen. He's a good guy. Okay? That's what God said to him. I know Mike Hoggard. Yeah, he's a good guy. You listen to him. So I sent him the web address to Sermon Audio this morning. And I want you to pray for him. He's a young man. Seems like a decent young man. Nice young man. But he's in a situation right now that he did not ask for. But it's laid in his lap. And he's crying out for help. Now, maybe, maybe you're the person this morning needs help. Maybe you are. And I'm telling you, there's enough people here in this church that if they don't know what you're going through, I don't know who else to bring in. Because I think just about everybody here has just been through just about everything there is to go through. Amen. And you know what? You know what he told me? It was a situation that I was very familiar with. I said, no kidding. And I wrote him back and I said, I know all about that. Imagine that. Two people meeting on a Friday, hot Friday afternoon at a gas station where neither one of us I wasn't going to stop there and get anything. I was going to keep on going. I was almost home. Boom. God blew the tire up right at that spot. Boom. He needed gas right at that gas station. And there he was. Now you look at Joshua 10. The men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. See how God connected them together, Brother George? Saving and helping. That's how God does it. When He saves us, He helps us. And He will send people our way to save us and to help us. So if you are here or you are online and you're the person who needs help, God is here to help you. God is here to save you. And God is here to show you who can be with you and be for you in the situations and the circumstances of your life. Who knows what it's like. But also, God then... Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we... Why did God have us go through what we went through? So He could comfort us, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. It's a turnaround deal. God gives it to us. We go through it. He helps us. We go to somebody. We see them, or they come to us, and they say, Man, I'm in a situation. I don't know what to do. I'm just... It's a mess. I'm just, I'm just about ready to give up. Just about ready to end it all. And you say, you know what? That's something that you brought that up to me because I've been through that very exact same thing. And I know exactly what you're talking about. And here's how God helped me. Boom! Two people that God uses for each other. 
I have been helped by the people in this church, by my family, by my friends, by people online that have never even been here. I have been helped by them. This couple here undoubtedly has prayed for this church and prayed for me. And I don't know what else he's done, but they have been a blessing to us. I guarantee you in some way or another, they've come here to ask me to help them. I'm not going to turn them away. Amen.